All right, I know I promised to make a review video of the XH2S, but time kind of slipped away and I didn't realize it's suddenly February of 2023 as I'm making this video. Um, so I thought, you know, instead of making just another review video like every other YouTuber, I'm just gonna do a six month review video like every other YouTuber. But this time, I'm gonna talk about my experience using this Fujifilm XH2S right here and let you know what it is, how good it is, and my user experience overall. So without further ado, cut to the B-roll. So I won't get into the technical detail of this camera. If you want to go super nerdy, like I mentioned, you can go check out other people's YouTube videos, uh, their review videos like Gerald Undone, CVP, or Josh from Cinnamon Dailies, even DP Review TV. They talk about the X-H2S extensively, talking about the sensor, the goods and the bads of this camera. With that being said, it does produce beautiful images from photos to videos and just for me, personally, it looks amazing. Again, the biggest selling point of any Fujifilm camera is being able to tweak and mimic old film stock. Not perfectly in line with older film cameras, but still good enough to have amazing looking JPEGs straight out of camera to upload to Instagram or Vero or wherever you're posting. But in case you don't know, I'm more of a filmmaker, so let's talk video. The 6.2K sensor produces some really crisp and sharp details, especially when you downscale it to 4K, it looks just absolutely gorgeous. And I love that this camera is able to record an open gate. If you don't understand the use case of open gate, well, it's a very simple concept really. And let me give you an example. Imagine you have a client that wants a video done. You shoot it, you edit it, and you delivered it in 16 by nine. They love it, but they come back and they say, we wanna post it on our social media platforms, but it keeps getting cropped. Please help us. You, an intellectual that shot in 6.2K open gate, will reply with, no worries fam, I got you. Not gonna lie, cringed a little bit while writing this script. So all you have to do is go back to that editing timeline and you can crop it to a 9x16 or 1 to 1. Having that extra information above and below the subject allows you to crop appropriately with no loss in quality. See. The thing is, with shooting 16x9 footage or 3x2 open gate footage, you lose a lot of information on the left and the right of the frame, yes. But with that additional height, you won't lose as much as cropping in a 16x9 footage. That's the basic gist of it. The only limitation with the X-H2S is the frame rates. You can only go up to 30p. But if it is a controlled shoot, you've got all your storyboards planned out, you know what kind of shoot you're doing, you're pretty much golden. Now, as much as I praise the 6.2K and the 4K footage coming out of the X-H2S, I do find that the 1080p suffers quite a bit, just like all other Fujifilm cameras. Now, I do find myself shooting mostly in 6.2K 25p or DCI 50p. Very rarely do I use the 120 or 240 frames per second, although I did do it for a very specific shoot that required it. But other than that, I didn't really use it. Although it's still great to know that your camera is actually capable of it when it is needed. Also, speaking of which, don't forget to turn these settings down. These will help make your footage look so much better. I don't know why Fuji didn't do this from the start, but it's a very simple fix. And please just do it. It will save you so much time, so much hassle, so much effort. All right, here it is. Turn down the high ISO noise reduction to minus four and your sharpness to minus four and you can turn all your footage from this to this. Speaking of what I use, I tend to shoot in H.265, mainly because of storage space. Now I know ProRes does a lot better in terms of color grading and on the editing timeline, but it uses so much space that I find it quite cumbersome. Now I've got an AngelBit 512 gigabyte CF Express Type B card in this uh, X-H2S, and these are the numbers for DCI 50P. Now in the three ProRes flavors of HQ, 422, and LT, they are 39 minutes, 58 minutes, and an hour, 23 minutes, respectively. But if you shoot in H.265, all I, 422, if you put it at 720 megabits per second, it's an hour, 34 minutes, and at 360 megabits per second, it's three hours and seven minutes. So putting that into context, you can save so much space just by shooting H.265 at 360 megabits per second. 
but obviously use it where you need to. If you are shooting H.265 at 720 megabits per second, forget that. Just shoot ProRes LT because you won't be saving that much space anyway. But honestly, for most of my work, H.265 at 360 megabits per second is plenty enough. On top of that, I can get a 256 gigabyte UHS-2 SD card and record sequentially, which gives me four hours, 39 minutes of record time because ProRes only records into the CF Express Type B card, not into the SD card. So that's awesome and all, but that's a total of 768 gigabytes of footage. So use it where it counts. Also, I shoot mostly in F-Log2 if I'm just using this camera. But if I were going to, oh, I don't know, shoot two cameras with the X-T3 or this camera right here that's filming me right now, I would shoot in F-Log. It just makes matching the cameras so much easier. But F-Log2, dynamic range, just brilliant and amazing. Recovering those shadows and recovering those highlights, it's, it's just a bloody cheat code. It's so good. But anyway, speaking of vlog footage, this camera's low light capabilities is still mind blowing to me. Now, I know it's not the quality of like a Sony a7S III, but it's still really, really good. I can easily go to ISO 8000 with no worries of the noise pads being too overpowering. Obviously, it's better if you shoot at the native ISOs, but I'm still very happy with how the noise looks, even at ISO 8000. Obviously, the 14-bit dynamic range sensor really helps, and it also helps that the camera is made to look more filmic. So the noise pattern isn't just a smudge of cyan and magenta, but it kind of just looks like film noise, which makes it so usable. And also, using any noise reduction software or plugin from your NLE pretty much clears it up. It's not perfect, but it works very well. So I did mention the native ISO of the X-H2S. So if you're shooting an F-Log, that's 640 and 2000. And if you're shooting an F-Log 2, that's bumped up to 1250 and 3200. If you're watching this to compare with the X-H2, I believe the ISO range of the X-H2, the native ISO of the X-H2 is lower than the X-H2S, but I'll put it like somewhere here so you can see. All right, next up, let's talk about the IBIS. So if you've watched review videos of the X-H2S, you've seen that the IBIS is good, but it's not the best, especially compared to the new Panasonic S5 Mark II, which has the best IBIS in any hybrid camera on the market. And I personally think, yeah, that's really good. That's sort of like a replacement to gimbals. However, I found that this X-H2S's IBIS is still really, really good. It's good enough for me. Shooting handheld all day for events, uh, it worked like a breeze. I never felt like the IBIS was trying to fight any of my movements. The only time that has ever happened to me was when I accidentally turned IS boost mode on uh, and I didn't know what it was for the first time and I got really scared and confused by that. So turn your IS boost mode off if you're not gonna move around with it. So what I found works for me is actually having to move slower. So going really quickly left and right, panning left and right. Uh, I found moving slower actually helps the IBIS not fight my movements. And if I do move quicker, then I would probably have to turn the IBIS off. Now, it's obvious enough for me to say that this is not a gimbal replacement. Don't think that just because the IBIS plus DIS plus OIS is really good, it will replace your gimbal. It probably won't. Honestly, it most definitely won't. But if you don't have the time to set up a gimbal and you have to go run and gun, it's there for you. It's sturdy enough that it looks good, but has that handheld feel and it doesn't feel like you're shaking too much without a gimbal or an IBIS. Now, as of recording this video, Fujifilm has released a firmware version 3.0, which I have yet to update and test my camera with, but apparently that has a lot of autofocus updates for the X-H2S. But even before the firmware update, I found that the X-H2S's autofocus was really good. So this footage of my niece you're seeing now was shot back in August, 2022. And as you can see from this test, it was still tracking the eye very nicely and it was still very sticky, which is really good. My recommendation is to actually use a single point AF and use your finger to select the right point of focus that you want. 
It's not going to give you the same accuracy as manual focus, but that's the risk of autofocus. So speaking of that event, I found that this camera's battery life was really good as well. I managed to do that whole shoot with just six batteries. But if you are going to shoot all day, non-stop recording, I would definitely rec recommend you to get a power bank or a V-Lock battery or, you know, even the battery grip for the uh, X-H2S. So you get three batteries instead of one. That's just really good. I think that's worth it in my opinion. But for my case, again, I don't really use a power bank. Uh, it's not power bank. I don't really need that battery grip. Also, that battery grip is really expensive. But overall, still hasn't filled me yet. Hasn't stopped in the middle of recording. So still very happy with this camera. It still has yet to fail me. Uh, knock on wood. Knock, 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 knock on wood. <sighs> Now I want to talk about the biggest concern of a lot of people using Fujifilm cameras for video. Even I experienced this myself using the Fujifilm X-T3 and when I borrowed and my friend's X-T4, it also happened to me and that is overheating. Now I want you to listen and listen closely, all right? You do not have to worry about overheating with the Fujifilm X-H2S, all right? I use this under 35 degrees Celsius heat. I live in Indonesia, a tropical country that is very hot and very humid. And I shot this for two days under the sun and I got sunburnt, but this camera constantly recorded nonstop, no problems at all. I was sunburnt, my X-T3 was overheating, it was yelling at me, the Atomos Ninja 5 that was on top of my X-T3 was burning my hands, but this X-H2S was completely fine. It was fine, all right? Now, we were shooting 15 to 20 minutes at a time, but the X-C3 and the Atomos Ninja 5 tried to kill me, but the X-H2S, perfectly fine. No overheating symbol whatsoever. We were in a greenhouse. We were out in, under the sun. We were in front of manure. It was a crazy weekend. Also, quick tip, bring sunscreen. Wherever you go on a shoot, Bring sunscreen because you don't know if you're going to get sunburned or not. So just slap on that sunscreen on your bloody neck and your hands and your face everywhere. Also bring aloe vera just in case sunscreen isn't enough so you can just rub it in. And yeah, it's terrible. It's really bad. Anyway, speaking of the Ninja 5, I actually used it on the X-H2S, but it didn't last long. I would only use it now as a monitor instead of a monitor recorder, mainly because the X-H2S is not able to output 6.2K to the Ninja 5. And the Ninja 5 would end up showing a 1080p signal instead of 6.2K. Now, this isn't a limitation of the X-H2S, it's actually a limitation of the Ninja 5. If you want to get 6.2K out into a recorder, external recorder, definitely go for the Ninja 5 Plus. But obviously, it's a lot more expensive, so you got to deal with that. And to those who ask, yes, the Ninja 5 is able to record in ProRes RAW, but only at 4.8K, 24 frames. But I have not tried it, and I don't think I will try it anytime soon because it's too big and I don't see a use for it. Also, it goes back to what I said about ProRes footage, use it where you need to. But yeah, that's pretty much all I have to say about the X-H2S. It's still a fantastic camera, and I love it. I know it may be a little behind in terms of specs compared to, I don't know, Canon or Panasonic or even Sony, but in my opinion, it's a much more fun camera to use. And this is my final reason why I decided to stick with Fujifilm instead of going to Sony or Canon or Panasonic, right? It's because this whole ecosystem is actually one of the cheapest options. Maybe the lenses are a bit expensive. Yeah, okay. They're old and they're still expensive, but they're still cheap and they're still well built. They still have support for these cameras 10 years down the line, and it's insane. And I think that is why I decided to stick with Fujifilm. Now, I know what you're gonna say, I know you're gonna say, but Ken, you could have gone for the Panasonic GH6, why not go with that? Well, I would argue, why would I go Micro Four Thirds when I could go APS-C Super 35, and then, you might say something like, oh, Ken, but you can go for Blackmagic. The Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 6K Pro is amazing. You know, why don't you go for that? 
Well, my argument would be, well, it is good. It's a good camera. I'm not going to I'm not going to lie. It's a good camera and it's really cheap. Also, you get DaVinci Resolve for free if you get that camera. But there's no support for the Blackmagic in Indonesia at the moment. So that's what I found. That's why I decided to stick with Fujifilm. Fujifilm support here is one of the best. And that's why I'm sticking with Fujifilm. So yeah, the X-H2S is the best choice for me. Now, it's not to say that this camera is perfect. This camera has its flaws as well. But they end up just being nitpicks. Like, for example, the ISO dial. It only moves one way. It go, it's, Even with the new firmware, it only moves one way. It doesn't move the other way. It's one way. Which is kind of annoying, but, you know, you learn to live with it. Next thing is aspect ratio guides. It's just a nice to, it's just a nice to have. Um, another thing is a box around the screen to show you whether it's recording or not. That I think that's a good indicator of recording. Uh, another one is another thing is um, having waveforms and adjustable moving, being able to move it anywhere while you're recording. That's nice. Uh, being able to pick your to to pick your focus that's also nice uh and the final thing is the menu is too large there's too much manual controls it's good to have manual controls it's good to be able to pick and choose select whatever you like for the menu but there's some things in there that i think should be not there but anyway i hope i didn't bore you with this video uh it's a particularly long video but hey if you enjoyed this video, hit that thumbs up and hit that subscribe button. And I know I said I don't subscribe in the previous videos. I basically dropped that mantra and because, well, I'm an attention whore. So, yeah, hope to see you in the next video, I guess. See ya.